All right, thank you um, everyone and uh, for joining today's webinar on uh, risk redu reduction initiatives for PFAS. So I'm Eva Lainala from the OECD. Uh, and this uh, webinar is in the context of the work of the um, OECD UNEP Global uh, PFC Group to uh, support a shift to safer alternatives for PFAS. So our um, past webinars can also be found on the OECD PFAS portal, along with other products uh, of work from the group, as well as um, uh, highlights of risk reduction initiatives uh, from countries. So I encourage you to um, also go to the OECD PFAS portal for further information. So I'm pleased uh, today to welcome uh, the US EPA, the European Commission, and the Secretariat of the Basel, Rotterdam, and Stockholm Conventions to provide updates on risk reduction initiatives that are going on uh, in these three bodies. So each um, will give around a 15 minute presentation uh, and then we'll have about uh, 10 minutes uh, time for questions and answers. Uh, in order to uh, submit a question that you'd like to um, give to a particular speaker, please use the question and answer function uh, that you'll find uh, within uh, the Zoom and not the chat function. So we'll be uh, selecting some questions, uh, depending on the amount of time we have uh, for the Q&A from, from, from that um, particular Zoom feature. So uh, with no uh, further ado, then I'd like to turn it over to Tala Henry and uh, Jeffrey Dawson from the US uh, EPA. Please go ahead. Thanks, Eva. Hi, Tala. So we'll do our normal thing, right? Yep. <laughs> okay. So uh, thanks everybody for having us here. We really appreciate the opportunity to come and uh, speak to you about what we're doing at the EPA on the PFAS issue. And we'll talk today about our roadmap and some of the activities that we're involved with. So again, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, next slide. So just for today, we're going to quickly talk about the EPA Council on PFAS, which is kind of our uh, across agency group that's dealing with this issue and some of the activities associated with that. And then we're going to talk about some of the key principles and goals outlined in the roadmap document, which is a part of the uh, council activities. Uh, Tal is going to talk about some of the more definitive actions and commitments that we've made, as well as the timelines, and then you know, where we're going with next steps. Next slide. So the EPA Council on PFAS, um, essentially, this was developed or established by Administrator Regan shortly he, after he took office or was, was um, uh, approved to be administrator in April of 2021. And it really laid out our bold and strategic whole of EPA strategy for addressing PFAS. And the council is composed of senior technical and policy leaders from across EPA. Uh, Tal and I are members of that group. Um, it's chaired by the Assistant Administrator for Water, Radhika Fox and also uh, regional administrator, Deb Zaro. So we have representation from our headquarters programs as well as from our regional offices. And the major output for the, uh, act, the, for the council so far has been the development of the strategic roadmap, which really lays out the whole of EPA's approach for tackling the PFAS issue. It sets timelines and talks about specific commitments and so forth. And one of the big uh, activities that Tal and myself have been involved with <clears throat> is the development of a national testing strategy. And once I'm done this talk, I will post in the chat links to both the roadmap document and the national testing strategy so you can look at it in more detail. And I'll also put it in the Q&A session if that works better. And the roadmap builds on some existing activities that we are already doing 
under the new administration to kind of restore scientific integrity and accelerate the pace of research associated with PFAS uh, within the EPA. So next slide, please. So the core principles that we've been working with and established in our roadmap document are outlined in this um, slide right here. And so there are five core principles. The first one is considering the life cycle of PFAS. So we wanna really develop an understanding about individual PFAS chemicals, how they're developed, how they're manufactured, their life cycle, how they're used, and then the, at their end of life, how to deal with um, decontamination and destruction and so forth. So we want to develop a thorough understanding of, about all that. It's, it's a baseline for you know, how we're going to approach the problem. And then we want to get upstream of the problem and we want to think about ways of eliminating the potential source of exposure to the environment before it happens. So we're really uh, trying to be proactive in thinking about that. And we're making a commitment to hold polluters more accountable there are several issues ongoing within the U.S. related to PFAS pollution, so we want to try to minimize that as much as possible. And of course, we're making better efforts to uh, further ensure science-based decision making. And we also have a, a large across-government effort to focus on the protection of disadvantaged communities, and that definitely is part of our activities related to PFAS. So, next slide. <clears throat> And then also within the roadmap document, there, these three goals are core to our approach. So the first is investing in additional research and developing an increased understanding about PFAS exposures and toxicities, um, both from a human health and ecological effects perspective. The second is restricting PFAS. Um, so we wanna, we're pursuing a comprehensive approach to proactively prevent PFAS from entering the environment um, within the, the confines of what our statutes allow. And then we're also looking at uh, uh, increasing our levels of remediation associated with PFAS contaminated areas. So that's a, that's a major focus for us ac across the board. So, so I've talked a little bit about you know, what we're doing from a very broad perspective within EPA related to PFAS. And I'm gonna turn it over to Tala, who's gonna talk a little bit more about some of the details within the individual national program. So thanks. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Jeff. Good morning, everyone, at least over here. <laughs> uh, good evening to some of you, I think. Um, now what I'm going to do is go uh, and cover some of the major actions across the whole of EPA. I mean, generally in the OECD, you hear a lot from our chemical office, but I'll be covering all of our various media offices, including water, air, the cleanup program, um, and the Office of Water. But I will start right here at home with the Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention. Many of you know that's where our toxics and our pesticides office live within. So as Jeff mentioned, um, one of the a major component of the roadmap is this publication of a national uh, testing strategy. And that was a collaborative effort between our office, OCSPP, and the Office of Research and Development. And that testing strategy was published on the same day as the roadmap back in October. So we are well on our way. It uses category approaches and cites the OECD, it's long history there. Um, and we're moving on to get test orders out the door. We are also um, the office that, that reviews new uh, chemicals. And so we will continue to ensure a robust review process for any new PFAS that may be submitted. Um, certainly we know a lot more than we did decades ago as PFAS were being submitted and about half of the PFAS on the Tosca inventory today never underwent any kind of new chemical review. They were grandfathered in, so to speak, onto the inventory back in the 70s. Um, we're also reviewing those existing PFAS that, that either got on the inventory just um, with, a, with a buy or 
Uh, also looking back at some of those we approved in the past um, to potentially tighten those up. And for those which we know have gone out of commerce, we can also close the door on, on those using our uh, TOSCA significant new use rule authority. Uh, in addition, both uh, mandated by Congress and on our own volition, we are enhancing PFAS reporting under our to toxics release inventory. We added 172 to that inventory for reporting heretofore uh, back in <clears throat> a couple of years ago. And then each year we have an obligation to look to see if there are additional PFAS that would be added to that reporting. And that's annual reporting of releases um, of PFAS from manufacturing facilities and federal facilities here in the U.S. Um, also, we have uh, proposed a broad, very broad um, rulemaking to gather all existing information, such as production volumes, uses, worker exposures, any existing uh, effects data um, that was proposed last year, and we'll need to finalize that before January 1st of 2023, and that will be reporting for any PFAS manufactured since 2011. So um, we think that's gonna be a pretty significant amount of information coming forward. Now moving on to the Office of Water, which is very, very engaged and busy in this area as well. Um, they have published a final rule last December to initiate nationwide monitoring for PFAS in drinking water. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a few handfuls of PFAS that will be required to be um, measured, um, kind of limited to an extent by the available technologies um, for, for measurement. Um, they're also um, under, have underway to establish a primary drinking water regulation, also known as the MCL, maximum contaminant level, for PFOA and PFOS. They pro will propose that rule this year and then take about another year to finalize that. Um, they have published a toxicity assessment for Gen X chemicals. And then our Office of Research and Development has underway the development of five additional toxicity values for a variety of other uh, PFAS. Uh, the Office of Water also, though, is moving on. Oftentimes, they'll publish a health advisory in advance of the, the rulemaking work that takes place to publish the MCLs. So they are, in fact, working on development of health advisories for Gen X and PFPS. These are two uh, PFAS that we <clears throat> recently have these toxicity values for. So they'll put them into a health official health advisory. Uh, they're effluent program is also looking to restrict PFAS discharges from a variety of industrial sources. Those, those are rulemakings, but and these effluent limitation guidelines or ELGs um, go and look sector by sector, industrial sector. So they have proposed um, and are looking at uh, different uh, industrial sources from which you could uh, limit discharges through the effluent guidelines. Also using the NIPDES, as we call it, the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System to um, really look at reducing PFAS discharges through the permitting process. This is the, uh, to discharge into waters of the US, one needs to have a permit to do so. So they're looking to limit that way as well. They also are continuing to publish improved analytical methods. And again, they're, those, the, much of the um, analytical method development is in collaboration with the Office of Research and Development. And those um, come along as they come along and are published as final that way. Um, also moving on to the Clean Water Act, most of this, the, the Drinking water regulations are for, for the Safe Drinking Water Act, so drinking water, and then of course the um, discharge program, but also we have under the Clean Water Act, the ambient water quality program. And so they're developing final uh, ambient water quality criteria for PFAS expected um, later this year into, and then rolling into 2024. Um, there's also, um, some fish tissue monitoring data, and they want to enhance that uh, 
data availability to the public. And then they're working on uh, risk assessments for PFOA and PFOS in biosolids. Certainly, I think we've all um, know or heard that um, some of the land contamination has resulted um, due to the application of biosolids land. <clears throat> Moving on to a couple of our other offices, the Office of Land and Emergency Management, or OLM. This is the office that takes care of the Superfund and the Resources Conservation and Recovery Act, so the, basically the remediation and cleanup programs. Um, one of their big actions that is ongoing here, and they expect to propose this rule soon, is to designate PFAS as circular hazardous substances. And that designation means something legally and gives um, the agency and states more leverage to um, basically facilitate cleanups. Um, they are also working on an advance notice approach, proposed rulemaking. This is a step that's taken to uh, will make the public aware of our thinking and take comment. Um, and gather information. Um, so they're putting kind of the very first step um, to, to the, getting to this. So they are doing the first step to the hazardous substances designation for a number of additional PFAS. They have, are working on updating a guidance um, regarding the destruction and disposal of PFAS. Um, there is a uh, an earlier version out there with the, the technologies um, for destruction in particular keep advancing. So we'll work on updating that. And then under the other law that they implement, the Resources Conservation and Recovery Act, they are initiating two additional rulemakings. And again, there that would address things having to do with remediation at operational facilities. Moving to the Office of Air and Radiation, um, they're just initiating, uh, basically getting all the technical information together to address PFAS air emissions. They set discharge limits. They also do a lot of work around technologies for limiting um, emissions. So they're um, at kind of the beginning stages of um, work um, in the air media. Um, as I mentioned throughout here, our Office of Research and Development is very much engaged um, along with many of the program offices. So they continue to develop and validate methods for detection and measurement. Um, as you all know, I'm sure um, different methods are often needed for different media. Um, so they continue to crank out new methods there. They are also advancing the science to assess human health and environmental risks. As I mentioned, they're working on quite a few toxicity values um, for a variety of PFAS. And they're working also with the Office of Water on several of their projects, as well as, as my office. Um, and they also are very much engaged with the, the waste office to evaluate and develop technologies for reducing PFAS in the environment. So destruction and disposal methods. There's also a number of cross program or EPA wide um, activities as part of the roadmap. Um, and I'm not gonna read all of these, but clearly we want to engage with our stakeholders. We want to use any and all enforcement tools um, that are at our disposal. Um, we, as I mentioned, our testing strategy is very much based on the use of categories. Um, and also we are at the very beginning stages of thinking about what a voluntary stewardship program would look like. Many of you may be familiar that we had a PFOA stewardship program in the early 2000s that was quite successful. So we'd like to look back and see what we can learn there and potentially do something further for more PFAS. Um, there's some risk um, communication work ongoing, and then there'll be an annual report on our progress as part of all of this. I'll just leave these next steps up for a moment um, as we change um, over. I'll turn it back to Eva until she tells me to turn my camera off. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Tala and Jeff, uh, for giving us an overview of a really a large number of different activities that are going on. 
uh, at the at the EPA uh, and in different uh, parts of the EPA. Uh, you'll note as well that um, Jeff has uh, included in the chat uh, links uh, to the testing strategy and the roadmap and um, uh, general EPA information on PFAS. So I encourage you to um, look at those for uh, further information as well. So um, thanks, Tal. Well, there's some questions coming up, so we'll hopefully come back to you uh, with uh, with for some questions at the after all of the speakers. So thank you very much. And then next we'll move um, on to uh, a presentation from. Valentina Bertato from the European Commission, who will uh, speak to uh, initiatives underway uh, within the, the Commission. Thanks, Valentina. Hello, I was trying to, uh, I was training, uh, to, uh, trying uh, to share the screen, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't see now the button. And I know we tried earlier and it yes, worked. It, um, oh. it should be right at the bottom of your screen if your platform is the same as mine. Yeah, I, I don't see it. Okay. So maybe uh, we can try the backup solution. So you, you move the slides uh, and uh, I speak. Yes, is it, um, could uh, Paula or Marianne, can you display the slides, please? Perfect, thank you. So just um, uh, let Paula know when, um, then, uh, when the next slide okay. uh, happens. Yeah. And Paula, if you can just put it on presenter mode. Okay, good. So uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm Valentina Bertato. I work uh, in DG Environment at the European Commission. And I made a presentation some time ago at the OECD on the EU action on PFAS. So today it's going to be an update because a lot has happened uh, in the last years. So next slide, please. So where uh, did it all start? Uh, I mean, we had been working on restricting some PFAS, especially the long chain ones for some time, but where we really uh, got a strong political push to, to do more was uh, in 2019, when the European Council concluded uh, this meeting and uh, asking the commission to develop an action plan to eliminate all non-essential uses of PFAS. So this was a, a very quick, clear request from the Council to the Commission. In the same year, uh, the last uh, European Council of the year, we had uh, the, the Netherlands that announced their decision to prepare a risk restriction dossier for all PFAS. And also in this case, uh, they, they committed to restrict all PFAS except those that are essential for society. Uh, in the meanwhile, we started to work on the chemical strategy. I will say something uh, more on that later on. And in July 2020, we had also the European Parliament in a resolution on the chemical strategy that uh, pointed out again to the need to act uh, to address the concerns of PFAS. Also, the European Parliament asked for an action plan to, to have a phase out of all non-essential uses. And it also asked to accelerate the development uh, and the research uh, looking for alternatives to all uses of PFAS. So next slide, please. So what did the Commission do? Uh, I think that uh, uh, we have uh, some key policy documents uh, where we have committed to act on PFAS. So the first one uh, was the, the European Green Deal, uh, which, as you know, covers uh, different environmental objectives. But we have there uh, a zero pollution ambition for a toxic free environment. And it is on this objective that uh, we built uh, uh, all the support for the chemical strategy. And the European Green Deal also speaks about uh, addressing uh, uh, the concern of very persistent chemicals. As I said, following the European Green Deal, uh, we worked on uh, the Chemical Strategy for Sustainability, which was published uh, in October 2020. And there we have uh, uh, a specific action plan on PFAS. And I will say more uh, on this later on. 
That was followed by the Zero Pollution Action Plan uh, in May uh, 2021. And again, uh, we have the commitment uh, to address uh, all type of pollution, including the chemical pollution, and uh, again, uh, with specific references to PFAS. The last uh, document, that the policy document, which is relevant uh, for PFAS is a STOI strategy that was uh, published just a few months ago. And uh, I will have a slide uh, specifically on the soil strategy. So next one, please. So first, let's start with the chemical strategy for sustainability, which is the key document for our work. Here, as I said, we have a specific reference to actions on PFAS. We explain why we believe we need to address the concern because of many cases of contamination of soil and water, including drinking water, and because of the human health and environmental concerns. Uh, what we wanted to achieve uh, with the, the actions of the strategy is uh, uh, to ensure specifically that uh, all uses of PFAS are phased out in the EU unless uh, they are proven essential. So we basically here uh, pick up on, on uh, the request both of the European Parliament and of the Council. So we announced in the chemical strategy also a restriction and a reach on all PFAS and firefighting forms and also on other uses, again, ex except where they are essential for society. Next one. So what, what, what other uh, concepts is a chemical strategy introducing which are relevant for PFAS? So in the chemical strategy, we have a commitment to def define criteria for essential uses. You have heard me mentioning uh, uh, essential uses a lot. It's uh, indeed uh, an important aspect uh, for PFAS, but for the chemical strategy in general. And this is what uh, uh, we are currently doing. We are trying uh, uh, to define criteria which can be used under the chemical legislation for uh, future restrictions, but also more horizontally in other legislations. Uh, then uh, we have the commitment in the chemical strategy to propose new hazard classes uh, in the classification and labeling regulation. And uh, some of these classes are relevant for PFAS. Uh, we, have, uh, um, we have the intention to, to define a new class for persistence in mobility and bioaccumulation. And as you very well know, uh, PFAS are per persistent uh, and uh, many of them are mobile uh, and some of them can also be accumulative. Uh, then we have uh, uh, also an action that concerns the definition of substances of very high concern. Uh, so these are the substances that go in the candidate list and can be prioritized and for authorization. And here again, uh, we would like to introduce as a new class, as class of substance of, of very high concern, very persistent and very mobile substances. So again, another possibility to uh, address PFAS. So next one, please. So this is uh, just a, a brief visual on the actions of the PFAS action plan. I will not go through all of them, but I just wanted to underline that the uh, actions under the chemical legislation are not only a part of the picture because we want to prevent the emissions of PFAS by restricting them under the chemical legislation, but we know that we need to address them also under all the other legislations we have in the EU. Uh, because uh, we have a contamination that is already there and uh, also because we need to, to prevent emissions uh, from uses that have already happened and then through the waste. So for this reason, uh, we have different uh, chapters uh, in, uh, in the PFAS action plan that concern uh, the products, many PFAS are used in products, the uh, food contamination, and I will uh, briefly speak about this later, on water legislation, uh, industrial emission legislation, so how to control the emission from uh, uh, production sites, waste, what happens at end of life, uh, where do all the PFAS that are in products end, and the soil, uh, I mentioned already the soil strategy. Uh, at international level, I will not speak a lot because I know that Kay is going to, to go into this, but we commit in the uh, chemical strategy in the PFAS action plan to support uh, all uh, international actions for, for a ban of the most relevant PFAS. And finally, under research and development, we are funding uh, studies and projects uh, to, to try to, to develop new analytical methods uh, to uh, address uh, the, the main pollution cases of PFAS, uh, to decontaminate, and this is already ongoing. So next slide. 
I said I was going to speak briefly about the soil strategy uh, because this is one of the latest document that we published. Here uh, we have a key commitment to prevent the release and emissions of hazardous substances into soil and uh, we mentioned specifically PFAS. We have many uh, cases of contamination uh, from PFAS uh, in Europe and new ones are discovered uh, every year and we think that this is just the tip of the iceberg. So the, the soil strategy is also announcing uh, a soil health law. We don't have uh, uh, a soil regulation or directive until now in Europe, but uh, the objective is to have one. And there will be a legally binding provision to identify contaminated sites, to have an inventory of such sites, and then to remediate those uh, that pose uh, the, the biggest risk. And as you, as you can imagine, this is going to be fundamental for PFAS because we believe that we have many more contaminated sites than those that are officially listed and where they started the remediation. Next slide, please. So what is happening now uh, under REACH? So I, I'm mostly working on the actions on PFAS under the chemicals legislation REACH plus the actions under the Stockholm Convention. But for REACH, we, we have really a lot going on. So we have a, a restriction on PFHXA and related compounds. Uh, these are the so-called C6 uh, alternatives to PFOA and P4. So the, the whole process uh, has finished in the European Chemical Agency and we will receive very soon the ECAS committee op opinion and we will proceed with a proposal uh, for restricting this group of PFAS. Then uh, the Commission requested ECA uh, to restrict uh, all PFAS in firefighting forms, and we just received uh, a few days ago the final dossier, which was submitted from ECA, the dossier submitter, to uh, the scientific committees, and they will now start to discuss. The discussion will likely uh, take uh, from nine months to, to one year. And when it is finished and we have the opinion, uh, we will proceed also in this case uh, with the uh, regulation under REACH to, to restrict the use of PFAS in firefighting forms. What about all the other uses of PFAS? Uh, you, you might remember that I mentioned before that the Netherlands uh, announced that they wanted to prefer a restriction dossier, and this is what uh, uh, they are doing in uh, collaboration with uh, four other authorities. So we have a joint effort with the Netherlands uh, together with Germany, Denmark, uh, Sweden and Norway. They are preparing the dossier for restricting all uses except those in firefighting forms, which are covered by the ECA dossier. And uh, the submission in this case is expected uh, uh, in July 2022. And I have linked here uh, the web page of ECA where you can follow the progress on all these actions. So next one, please. I'm moving now a, a little bit outside of my area of work. Uh, so just to explain what is ongoing under other EU legislation, uh, we have uh, uh, a lot of actions under the water legislation, uh, the drinking water directive. Uh, uh, it was the first one that introduced uh, a limit for PFAS, but not only for a specific PFAS, but for all PFAS. So these limits uh, that you can see here in the slide uh, will enter into force in January 2026. But by January 2024, uh, the Commission needs uh, to publish technical guidance on analytical methods to be able to implement these limits. And the colleagues uh, uh, of the Drinking Water Directive are uh, uh, working intensively on this uh, uh, with the help uh, of uh, technical consultants. Then uh, the Groundwater Directive, uh, which is meant to protect uh, groundwater, uh, uh, which is an important source of drinking water in the EU. So they are also considering limits for PFAS. They, they have uh, two options, uh, a EU limit for a group of 10 PFAS, or uh, following the example uh, of the Drinking Water Directive, a EU limit for all PFAS, for the whole family. Uh, there is also the possibility under the Groundwater Directive uh, to have member states uh, proposing uh, specific limits uh, for individual PFAS. Uh, in this case, the Commission proposal should be adopted this year, and after that, uh, it will go to the European Parliament and the Council for the uh, ordinary legislative process. Next one, please. So then we have the Water Framework Directive, uh, which is protective uh, surface water. Here we, we have one limit for one PFAS 
for PFOS, uh, but uh, uh, the directive is being reviewed with the objective uh, to uh, have limits for additional PFAS, and they are considering a list of 24 PFAS. Uh, looking uh, at all the, the hazard data and trying to, to set uh, uh, a limit based, based on the toxicological information. So also in this case, like in the case of the groundwater directive, uh, the commission expects uh, to adopt uh, the uh, proposal in 2022. Next slide, please. I think this is the last uh, European legislation I wanted to talk to you about, uh, and it is the food contaminants regulation. Here it is uh, another DG, it's not my DG, DG Environment, but it's DG Sante uh, in charge of this. You might be aware of the EFSA opinion of some months ago that was uh, considerably lowering the tolerable weekly intake for a, a group of four PFAS. So it is now a very uh, low one, 4.4 nanogram per kilogram of body weight. And uh, uh, the findings of EFSA is that the part of the European population exceeds this value. So this is why uh, the colleagues, they have started uh, to work uh, to propose maximum levels uh, for uh, uh, this PFAS in some food, uh, the food where we can more often find them, and uh, also including a recommendation uh, for uh, uh, monitoring. Also, in this case, uh, we expect uh, the uh, EU proposal this year. Next slide, please. So this was the last one. I have uh, uh, included here all the links to the uh, relevant EU strategies, which I mentioned, uh, where you can find all the information. And uh, I will stay then uh, online to reply to any question. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Thank you very much, uh, Valentina, also for the update from the, the Commission and what's happening in the EU. Um, so yeah, these slides and the recording of the webinar will be shared afterwards so people have access to these links um, also from the EU um, to find out further details and information on the wide number of activities uh, that is occurring also in the EU. Uh, so we'll move now um, to uh, uh, the BRS uh, Secretariat, the Basel um, Rotterdam and Stockholm Convention, and uh, Kay Ono Woodall will give us an, an update on uh, the recent um, advances of the work of the Stockholm Convention. So thank you, Kay. Right. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. So I'm uh, Kay Ono from the Secretariat, and I'll talk about the, the recent ones from, from the Secretariat of the Stockholm Convention on POPs. Um, this, it was last year already, a year has changed, but it was the 20th anniversary of the adoption of the Stockholm Convention. And uh, over the years, there has been quite a number of uh, development around the Stockholm Convention, including the synergies process and the increase in the number of parties. As of now, we have 185 parties bound to the Stockholm Convention provisions. And these are all thanks to the stakeholder support. And we are really happy to collaborate with this OEC. PFC group and other uh, member states and organizations uh, part of this. And we will have effectiveness evaluation um, conducted at uh, COP11 in 2023. So we are currently collecting information on the implementation status of the Stockholm Convention, including for PFAS. Um, here I listed the uh, POPs listed under the Stockholm Convention. Currently, we have 30 chemicals listed. And when I say uh, chemicals, it also includes a group of chemicals. So P PFOA, for example, has PFOA salts and PFOA related compounds. So it's more than 30 chemicals um, covered under the convention. Um, but you can see that uh, from PFAS, uh, there are currently three, two groups of chemicals already listed and one to be considered at the next meeting of the conference of parties and there is one under review so i'll talk a little bit about those and uh, listed under the stockholm convention and under review the first one is PFOS, it's salts and PFOSF. this was listed in 2009 in annex b to the convention with acceptable purposes that means that the exemptions are uh, there's no time limits to it 
and specific exemptions that is allowed for five year period um, with potential for uh, extending another five years. And there is a process to evaluate the continued need for those exemptions. Um, this was is led by the COP's review committee and the secretariat, and the COP is to take a decision on what to do with those exemptions. So at the 2019 COP, the an amendment to Annex B was adopted to eliminate some of those exemptions. So as you can see the bottom half of this slide, six of the specific exemptions have been removed and seven of the acceptable purposes were removed. So as of 2020 December, which uh, became effective uh, for most of the parties, we now have two specific exemptions, hard metal plating and firefighting forms, and one acceptable purpose for uh, insect bites with sulfuramid for the control of leaf cutting ant bites. The next review process will start from uh, next as of next POPROC meeting in January. Then the next chemical is PFOA. It's salts and PFOA related compounds. Those are listed under Annex A to the Stockholm Convention with uh, a number of specific exemptions that um, there are nine applications with time limited exemptions. It entered into force on 3 December 2020 with the definition listed here. It's quite complicated definition, but it was um, uh, discussed by the POPs Review Committee and adopted in the decision text. So nine applications you can see uh, in this slide. Um, then in, in the listing, sorry, I, yeah. And in that, in that listing, um, there was another decision adopted along with the amendment to Annex A which prescribes the need for um, the uh, indicative list of chemicals covered by, by the Stockholm Convention. And here the Secretariat was requested to compile this information in consultation with the POPs Review Committee. And this, the, the latest list is now available in, in document POPROC 17 slash IN 14. This will be reviewed at the POPROC 17 meeting uh, taking place next week. And currently there are 355 substances matching the definition listed there. And there's also another table indicating uh, the chemicals that are not covered under the listing. And that uh, additional decision also included the process for reviewing specific exemptions for the use of PFOI for the production of PFOB. This is for the, the pharmaceutical application. And this, is going to take place a little bit later, the information collection in 2025, and it will be reviewed at POPROC 2022, uh, sorry, POPROC 22 in 2026. Then um, finally, the, it is also worthwhile to note that the same set of chemical will be considered for listing in Annex 3 to the Rotterdam Convention, which is for the trade uh, information exchange on trade, and this will be considered at the face-to-face -face segment of the Rotterdam Convention uh, COP. And uh, uh, the decision also notes that, that the part, can, parties and others, when you're using alternatives to PFOA, salts and PFOA, to avoid using regrettable substitution and have uh, to avoid negative uh, environmental or human health and socioeconomic impacts due to their persistency and mobility. So, something about alternatives is also noted there because um, PFHXS, as you know, uh, could, be, could be used as an alternative to PFOS, now is uh, to be considered for listing in Annex A to the convention uh, during the face-to-face -face segment of next COP. This is scheduled to take place in June this year in Geneva. The recommendation from the pop -ROC, uh, indicates that if there are alternatives available, this chemical should be listed without specific exemption. But due to the complexity of chemical identity, it also has the similar request, um, but possibly to establish a process for the identification of substances covered by the listing of PFHXS, it's also PFHXS related compounds. 
Um, currently, there's an indicative list available as the POPROC 15 slash if 9 document. Then um, the third set of chemicals, long chain perfluorocarboxylic acids, their salts and related compounds. And here, uh, this was proposed by Canada in 2021, and this will be considered next week by the POPROC. As, as you know, the applications are mainly the, the surfactants or production of fluoropolymers. And uh, it has the definition provided in the, the proposal document. And the committee is going to look at the, the Annex D screening criteria, which includes persistence, bioaccumulation, potential for long range environmental transport, and adverse effects. Then, next one. Yeah, so I have a little summary of what's expected during the next meeting of the POPROC. Um, as I said, the long chain perfluorocarboxylic acids will, is at the screening stage, and the risk profile stage would be some other chemicals, the chlorine plus and UP328, and the risk management evaluation stage, which is the last review process if the uh, pesticide methoxychlor. But there are two other considerations related to PFAS, which is to establish the process for ass assessment of alternatives to PFOS. And then to look at the indicative list of PFOA, as just, just mentioned. Now, um, other uh, related work for uh, PFAS um, uh, reduction, a PFAS risk reduction, is uh, relates to the Basel Convention. So many of you might uh, be aware that the Basel Convention adopted plastic waste amendments in 2019, uh, which became effective uh, so 1st January 2021. The amendments included um, uh, changes to Annex 2 to include plastic waste, including mixtures, making them subject to sub, um, prior informed consent procedure. But uh, what, is, what relates here is Annex 8 um, amendment, that specified that plastic waste containing uh, persist um, hazardous chemicals, such as persistent organic pollutants, are considered as hazardous waste and therefore managed in an environmentally sound manner and subject to prior informed consent procedure. Those listed in Annex 9, which is clear, clean, and ready for recycling, do not require prior informed consent procedure. And yes, the reason why it is necessary to control those plastics with hazardous chemicals is because uh, when it, those are recycled, properties of those hazardous chemicals and might have um, additional exposure to human health or environment during the use or, or, or disposal. And it could also be carried uh, with the um, in the plastic debris and or uh, microplastics, and it could be found in the environment. And so, uh, in order to support parties and others uh, uh, through technical assistance, um, the Secretariat of the BRS Conventions, as well as partners, are implementing a number of activities. So, in my next three slides, I will share with you some information on technical assistance activities. Um, one uh, being conducted by the Secretariat, uh, focus on implementation of the PFAS listed under the Stockholm Convention, and uh, mainly focusing on the treatment of firefighting form, but also other, other applications. It is um, very important to understand the, the condition of use of firefighting forms provided in new part, uh, new part 10 and to Annex A and part three to Annex B uh, of the Stockholm Convention um, related to firefighting form use containing PFOA or PFOS. It provides that um, it is not possible to uh, uh, import the firefighting form containing those substances except for the purpose of environmentally sound disposal. So normally, when you have specific exemptions, you can continue trade. But in the case of firefighting forms containing those substances, it's not uh, possible. It also provides that uh, firefighting form that contains those substances uh, should not be used for training. And 
should also be con uh, for testing. For the, so training and testing are not possible, even if you have the specific exemptions. And then by the end of 2022, which is really coming very quickly, um, parties needs to restrict the use of firefighting form um, uh, in, uh, that, in uh, sites where all releases can be contained, if possible, if the capacity allows. Then finally, there is a, a provision to make determined efforts for environmentally sound waste management. And so it requires a lot of um, awareness raising and uh, support in changing the legislation, especially in developing countries. So our technical assistance activities focus on, on this area. And then uh, with the, this is an information from uh, colleagues in Finland and uh, is co-leading the project together with US EPA and that uh, there is a technical assistance on PFAS reduction in the Arctic region, um, AFFF and other PFAS containing form phase out in the Arctic. So as I said, this is co-led by the Finnish government, uh, Finnish Environment Institute and the US EPA and has the, the participating countries from the eight Arctic uh, Council states. And the, the consultant is preparing inventories of uh, accused firms fighting form stockpiles and the questionnaire has developed. Um, information on contaminated sites is being collected and uh, the stakeholders are being supported to transition to alternatives. And so I understood there are 10 to 12 pilot projects targeting airports, oil terminals, etc. And uh, more information can be found in the, in the link this is, that is indicated here. We are also uh, co cooperating with uh, Jeff and UNEP in the, in the project that is to start very soon. Uh, we also contributed to the preparatory stage of this uh, Jeff UNEP full sites project um, to reduce uses and releases of chemicals of concern, including POPs in the textile sector. So this uh, project targets not just only PFAS, but also other POPs, but PFAS is indeed one of the, the very important uh, POPs that could be found in te the textile sector. We collected uh, baseline information from um, Asian countries that are indicated here, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Pakistan, and Vietnam. We did find that it was very difficult to collect information from those countries, but uh, we have developed this uh, project proposal and it will kick off in May. So thank you very much uh, for, uh, for your attention and, and the opportunity to present the information. Great, thanks. Thanks to all of you for those uh, perspectives. Certainly uh, it's uh, challenging, not just with PFAS, but with all uh, chemicals to um, understand uh, the value chain aspects and pass information along. And it's been an ongoing uh, discussion point um, among countries as well as how that can be improved. So I'd like to thank um, all of the speakers today uh, very much for um, providing updates to us on the, the risk reduction initiatives that are underway for PFAS. And also thank you to all the uh, participants who joined. Uh, the, uh, the recording um, will be available um, in the next couple of days and um, all of the participants will be informed um, and any of, any of those who registered to attend and couldn't attend will be informed of the posting of the presentation. So uh, with that, I'd like to close the seminar today and um, uh, also encourage you to go to the OECD PFAS portal uh, for more information about the work of the OECD uh, global PFAS group. So thank you too much, uh, so much and uh, enjoy the rest of your day or evening. Bye-bye. <laughs>